Before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our sponsor, Babbel. For a long time, I wish I spoke more than one language. I really wanted to learn Dutch because my family is from the Netherlands and I still have a lot of relatives there. I always thought it would be too difficult to learn to speak Dutch. Then I discovered Babbel and I realized learning a new language is not only something I could do, but Babbel makes it fun to learn. During the World Cup, it was a lot of fun to talk with my relatives about the games. Heb je de straf hoop gezien? That is it's I, it's fat, ignored, zal verheten. I also got to show off my Dutch skills to my friends who were cheering for other teams. Members of Pai Zu and Zenetra, Shehela Team, Kunin, Kerslanen. If you want to start learning a new language, you should check out Babbel because it's been scientifically proven you can start speaking a new language in just three weeks. Babbel's lessons are designed by real teachers so you learn real world conversations. You learn to have practical conversations so you can talk about travel, business, relationships, football, and more. Personally, I can't think of a better New Year's resolution than learning a new language. It's fun, rewarding, and has real-world implications. It can help you get a new job or a promotion, and it can help you when you travel. Can you imagine being able to order the perfect wine and perfect French while vacationing in France? Or order the most amazing meal in Spanish in a small family-run restaurant in Mexico. Learning a new language is like opening a door to a whole new world. Right now Babbel has a great deal for criminally listed viewers. By clicking on the link, you can save up to 60% off your subscription. So click on the link below to start learning a new language in just three weeks with Babbel and help support criminally listed. Number three, Sean Hordenbeck. On October 6, 2002, 11-year-old Sean Horbeck was riding his bike alone on a quiet road in Washington County, Missouri. That's when a man in a white Nissan pickup truck pulled up, knocked Sean off his bike, and drove off with him. Sean's disappearance devastated the community. His fifth grade classmates piled candy and notes on his desk, hoping for a safe return. The original search centered around a forest close to where he went missing. Searchers were worried about old mine shafts buried underground. In reality, the kidnapper, 36-year-old Michael Devlin, took Sean to his apartment in Kirkwood, Missouri. At first, Devlin kept Sean chained up in the apartment. He sexually assaulted Sean, even taping one of the occurrences. This lasted for about a month. Then Devlin took Sean out of his apartment, intending to strangle him. But Sean talked him out of it, promising not to run. Devlin ultimately decided not to kill the 11-year-old and brought him back to his apartment. He threatened to harm Sean's family if he tried to escape. For the next four years, Sean posed as Devlin's son. No one in the apartment complex paid attention to the pair. Residents kept to themselves. Devlin and Sean had seemingly normal lives. Devlin worked as a manager of a local pizza place. Sean was allowed to leave the apartment to hang out with friends and go on dates despite not being enrolled in school. He was even allowed to have his own cell phone. Meanwhile, his parents set up the Sean Horbeck Foundation, an organization dedicated to finding missing children. On October 6, 2006, four years after Sean's disappearance, the family circulated aged-enhanced photos of Sean. Sadly, no leads emerged from this. Sean would have graduated from elementary school in 2006. His school placed a gown on an empty chair in his honor. After almost four years of captivity, Devlin felt that Sean was getting too old. He set his sights on abducting another young child. On January 8, 2007, 13-year-old William Owen B., who went by the name Ben, was walking home from the bus stop in Franklin County when Devlin pulled up in his pickup truck, Sean in tow. He grabbed Ben and drove off. One of Ben's friends, Mitchell Holtz, witnessed the abduction. Mitchell, a truck enthusiast, got a good look at Devlin's Nissan pickup truck. He gave a detailed description to the police, giving them a huge lead. 
Three days later, two Kirkwood police officers visited the apartment complex for an unrelated call. As the officers were about to leave, they noticed the white pickup truck in the parking lot. The truck matched the boy's description perfectly. The police knew that Devlin owned the pickup truck. They were familiar with him from the pizza place where he worked. The officers knocked on Devlin's door. Devlin refused to let the police search his apartment. So the police kept a watch over the apartment. Then they brought Devlin in for questioning. He confessed that Ben was in his apartment. He also admitted that 15-year-old Sean Horbeck was in his apartment, a revelation that shocked investigators. Devlin told the police, I'm a bad person. FBI agents swarmed the scene. They found the two boys in the apartment playing video games. Sean's parents, Pam and Craig Akers, were driving when they received the news. They had to pull over because it was so shocking. On January 12th, 2007, four days after Ben was abducted and four years after Sean was kidnapped, the boys were reunited with their families. The press dubbed this the Missouri Miracle. When asked about the four years away from his family, Sean told reporters, I knew my family was out there and they would never give up. I mean, you just have to hold on to your life because if you don't, you're just going to be lost within yourself and you can't have that. Mitchell Holtz, the boy who helped break the case open, was rewarded with a pickup truck. Later that year, Michael Devlin pleaded guilty to over 70 counts of kidnapping, sexual assault, and attempted murder. He was given 74 life sentences and 170 years of federal time. In 2011, Devlin was attacked by another inmate with a handmade ice pick. He recovered from his injuries. As of January 2022, 29-year-old Ben Owenby lives in the St. Louis, Missouri area. 31-year-old Sean Horbeck also lives in the St. Louis area. He's married with a child of his own. Number 2. Katie Beers Katie Beers considered her early life to be like Cinderella, but not as a romantic fairy tale. In early 1983, at two months old, Katie's mother, Marilyn, took her daughter to a family friend who lived near Long Island, New York. The family friend and Katie's godmother, Linda Ingolari, lived with her husband, Sal. Marilyn worked as a cab driver and a private nurse and had a tough childhood of her own. She was in and out of Katie's life while the Ingarellis looked after her and her half-brother, John. Katie never knew her biological father. She lived with the Ingarelli family for most of her early childhood and they treated her like a slave. She was forced to walk barefoot to pick up food and cigarettes from a nearby convenience store. The couple forced Katie to do laundry and clean the house. Sometimes she'd be late for the bus and had to walk to school. Katie's teachers did not speak up when she was absent. Other children called her the cockroach kid. Child Protective Services visited the house and compiled a dossier. But they ultimately decided to let her stay with Sal and Linda in Glary. The Ingolaris would move from place to place, shoveling Katie and John with them. The situation worsened in the latter part of 1991 as Sal began sexually abusing 8-year-old Katie. One of the people Katie did trust was John Esposito, another family friend. Esposito showered the young girl with gifts. He was known as Big John and became a mentor to Katie's half-brother, Little John. Esposito was considered a mama's boy who never left home. He worked as a contractor. He built his own apartment above the garage of his family's home. One of his brothers was killed after being struck by a car when he was five years old. He had another brother die from a cocaine-induced heart attack at age 33. Esposito himself had legal problems. In 1978, he pleaded guilty to snatching a boy from a local mall. However, it's unclear what he was sentenced to. His half-brother, John, 
also accused Esposito of molesting him. But many people in the neighborhood thought that Esposito was just odd and let him be. In the early 1990s, Esposito's mother died and his family members believe they took the death hard. Six months after her death, he built a bunker underneath the garage. Esposito's garage was a popular place for neighborhood kids to hang out. He stocked with candy and video games. None of the kids knew that Esposito was building the bunker. In 1992, two days before Katie's 10th birthday, Esposito stopped by the Ingarelli home. He gifted Katie a Barbie dream house and took her to the arcade. After the arcade, Esposito took her back to his house where they played video games. He then turned on Katie, forcing her into the basement as she kicked and screamed. He moved the bookcase to reveal a cement hole in the floor. He ordered her to climb in. When she refused, he threw her in. The bottom of the hole had a six-foot tunnel that led to a six-by-seven-foot concrete bunker. A 200-pound concrete door sealed it shut. Katie's new prison was a wooden box suspended in the air. At times, she was chained to the wall by her neck. Esposito would bring her food, water, and blankets. The only light came from a television installed in the corner. She kept track of her disappearance from watching TV. To throw the police off, Esposito reported that Katie had gone missing at the arcade. He forced her to record a ransom message on tape, which he played over a payphone near the arcade. The police with a canine unit searched the area around the arcade with no luck. For almost 16 days, Katie was trapped in the bunker. Esposito constantly watched her with a closed circuit security camera he installed in the corner of the cell. He'd tell her she'd stay with him forever. He told the young girl that she would become his wife and mother his children. He also threatened to take pictures of her while she slept and tell the police that she was dead if she didn't listen. Katie barely slept during her captivity because she feared Esposito would attack her. Esposito, along with Sal and Galeri, were immediately suspected by the police. The police monitored Esposito around the clock. The constant surveillance took its toll on Esposito. He eventually confessed, telling his lawyer he knew Katie was alive and where she was. Esposito took the police to his bunker. A pair of police officers found Katie in the bunker. She had been trapped in the bunker for 16 days, from December 28, 1992 to January 13, 1993. The police arrested 43-year-old John Esposito. He was charged with multiple offenses that included sexual assault and kidnapping. He admitted to building the bunker specifically for Katie. During his 1994 trial, Katie never took the stand. So she didn't reveal publicly if Esposito sexually assaulted her during her captivity. Three charges were dropped as a result. John Esposito was found guilty of the other charges and sentenced to 15 years at Sing Sing Prison in Westchester County, New York. He died in a cell of natural causes in September 2013. During the investigation into Esposito, it was revealed that Sal had molested Katie before the abduction. Sal was charged with these crimes in 1994. His lawyers urged him to take a plea deal, sparing Katie from testifying, but he refused. Katie took the stand for this case and during almost three hours of testimony. The press noted how poised and courageous she sounded for someone who had suffered so much trauma. Sal Galeri was found guilty. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. He died after collapsing in his cell in 2009. After the kidnapping, Katie was placed in foster care. Her mother and Linda Angularly fought for custody, but they accused each other of mistreating the girl. By all accounts, Katie's foster home was very stable and Katie flourished. 
After years of abuse and neglect, Katie was treated like a normal kid. The foster family gave her chores to teach her responsibility. She was taken to the dentist and taught how to brush her teeth. Katie was able to contact her biological mother. She graduated from high school and went to college for business administration. That's where she met her husband. They married and had two kids. Her foster family gave her away at her wedding. In 2013, more than 20 years after her kidnapping, Katie began publicly talking about her ordeal. She spoke to many media outlets about her traumatic childhood. In these interviews, Katie said that the abuse she received from the Ingolaris prepared her to survive the abduction. In 2015, her book, Buried Memories, A Vulnerable Girl and Her Story of Survival, was published. Katie said it was the book she had wanted to write since she was 10 years old. It became a New York Times bestseller. Katie has used her experiences to become an inspirational speaker and counselor. Her story of hope and perseverance has become an inspiration to millions. Katie now lives in rural Pennsylvania with her husband and two children. Number 1. Shasta Groney Shasta Groney was the youngest of five kids. She lived with her two brothers, her mother and her mother's boyfriend, in a small house in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Her two oldest brothers were grown up and did not live with the family. On the night of May 15, 2005, the family had a barbecue at home. That was the last night they were all together. Early the next morning, 42-year-old Joseph Duncan III snuck into the family's home with a hammer, night vision goggles, and a sawed-off shotgun. He had been watching the family for days. Duncan had a long history of violent sex crimes. In 1980, 16-year-old Duncan was sent to prison for sexually assaulting a 14-year-old boy at gunpoint in Tacoma, Washington. He was paroled in 1994 after serving 14 years. On July 6, 1996, 11-year-old Sammy Jo White and her 9-year-old half-sister, Carmen Cubias, went missing from a hotel in Seattle, Washington. Duncan had kidnapped them and beat them to death with a crowbar. Their remains were found 17 months later. On April 4, 1997, Anthony Michael Martinez went missing while playing with friends in Riverside County, California. Anthony's body was found two weeks after he went missing. He had been sexually assaulted and struck in the head with a large rock. Duncan was not tied to these three murders and the cases went cold. In 1997, Duncan violated his parole by testing positive for marijuana. He was arrested at his sister's house in Kansas City and sent back to prison. He was released from prison for good behavior in 2000. He then relocated to Fargo, North Dakota. In March 2005, he was charged with molesting two boys at a playground in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. After he was arrested, he was released on bail. But before he could face the charges, he disappeared. This is when he turned up at Shasta Groney in her family's home. Early on the morning of May 16, 2005, eight-year-old Shasta woke up to her mom screaming that an intruder was in the house. When Shasta ran into the room, she saw a man in night vision goggles holding a sawed-off shotgun. The family thought he wanted money. Brenda's boyfriend, Mark, pleaded with Duncan as he, Brenda, a 13-year-old Slade, were bound with zip ties and forced to lay face down. Duncan then tied 8-year-old Shasta and 9-year-old Dylan by the wrist and led them out of the house and into his truck. After forcing the children into the vehicle, Duncan returned to the house. He bludgeoned 40-year-old Brenda Groney, 37-year-old Mark McKenzie, a 13-year-old Slade Groney with a hammer. Shasta could hear the screams from outside the house. Dylan managed to free himself and ran. Unfortunately, Duncan caught the boy and knocked him unconscious with a hammer. 
He then loaded him into the truck where Shasta was still sitting and then drove off. The next day, a neighbor noticed some blood on the house and called the police. The police entered the home and discovered the three bodies. An Amber Alert for Shasta and Dylan was issued. The police also set up billboards with pictures of the missing children. Duncan took the children across the state line to a remote campsite in St. Regis, Montana. In a fear of rage, Duncan revealed that he had murdered the children's family. He then raped and tortured Shasta and Dylan multiple times over the next few days. Duncan became increasingly agitated with the kids and took out most of his frustrations on Dylan. He viciously beat him multiple times. A few days later, Duncan shot Dylan in the stomach with a shotgun at close range. He then fired another shot at Dylan's head as he lay on the ground, instantly killing the young boy. Duncan told Shasta, who witnessed the murder, that it was an accident. He told her the second shot was to end his suffering. Duncan then asked Shasta how she liked to die. He could strangle her or shoot her like her brother. Hoping to buy some time, Shasta chose to be strangled. Duncan wrapped a rope around her neck and started pulling. Desperate and fighting for her life, Shasta called him by his nickname, Jet. The tactic made Duncan very emotional and he let her go. According to Shasta, this made Duncan think she cared about him. After seven weeks of captivity, Duncan offered to take her to his house. On July 2, 2005, the pair stopped at Denny's in Cure de Lane for dinner. One of the servers recognized Shasta from the billboards. A manager called the police, and within minutes, officers arrived at the restaurant and apprehended Duncan. A few days later, the police found the body of Dylan Groney at the remote campsite. In July 2005, Joseph Duncan confessed to kidnapping Shasta Groney and the murder of her family. The police searched Duncan's vehicle and found a sawed-off shotgun, a large knife, and the wallet belonging to Mark McKenzie. Plenty of camping gear was also found, suggesting Duncan planned on a long stay in the wilderness. Investigators also found tapes of Duncan committing the crimes against the brother and sister. Joseph Duncan pleaded guilty in a state court and he was sentenced to death in 2008. While in prison, Duncan also admitted the 1996 murders of Sammy Joe White and Carmen Cubias and the 1997 murder of Anthony Martinez. In 2011, he pleaded guilty to Anthony's murder and he was sentenced to life. He never went to trial for the murders of Sammy Joe and Carmen. Duncan waived his right to appeal in 2008. In late 2020, Duncan's lawyers revealed that he had terminal brain cancer and didn't have long to live. He died in March 2021 at the age of 58. A few days after his death, Shasta released a statement. She said, Today I woke up feeling like my soul was finally free. I hope other people affected by Joseph Duncan were able to wake up feeling the same way. After seven weeks of captivity, Shasta was reunited with her father, Stephen Groney. Shasta has tried to move on with her life, but has had trouble coming to terms with things. She was now facing life on her own and under the media's harsh spotlight. I was the little sister my brothers protected, she said in an interview with Fox, and my mom made sure that the family was always together. Shasta has attended therapy, but she has suffered from an eating disorder and self-harm. Her father had throat cancer and almost lost his home. At the time of this recording, Shasta Groney has four children and a fifth due in August 2022, and she is a supervising housekeeper at a hotel. Thank you so much for watching today's video. We just want to say a big thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video. Start speaking a new language in just three weeks with Babbel. Thanks again for watching.